Hello, hello, hello! Welcome to the Crochet Circle podcast. This is episode 64 and it is called Au Naturel because I seem to have just been working with loads and loads of undyed yarns at the moment. And also I am wearing a naturally dyed jumper, crochet jumper today, which is it's um, from Shilla's Dare. I made it a few years back, but every time I wear it, people will say, what is that pattern, please? So I'll just say it right now. It is the Sicily Top by Marie Wallen for Rowan. You can get it from Rowan's website when you sign up. And it is a free pattern. It is also on Ravelry. But if you don't want to use Ravelry, you can get it from Rowan. And I don't think it clicks through to Ravelry, but it might do. So I'll give you fair warning. It's a really lovely pattern. And every time I wear it, people love it and want to know um, where it's from. So it's in this kind of very raspberry pink colour. I have just discovered that I've got it on inside out. And I'm just going to front it out and wear it inside out all podcast long. Yep. Yeah, it definitely is. Whatever. Who cares? You wouldn't have known unless I pointed it out to you. And now those of you who are watching, it's all you're going to see is my <laughs> seams on the sleeves. It's a fashion feature, actually. I meant, I totally meant to do that this morning. I 100% meant to wear my jumper and set out. So, hello Crochet Clan, I hope you are well. Um, for those of you that are watching, it might look a bit odd, it might look like I'm looking up above or down below a lot. I'm testing out two different bits of kit today to see which one is best. And I'm not making the mistake I made last time, I'm only recording on one, I'm recording on both. Um, I have a new little camera and I just want to see if it's any good for this podcast recording and for the audio. And if it is, then I can minimise all the stuff that I've got for the podcast and just make it smaller and more portable, which is quite handy for some of the devilish plans that I have for the podcast and for other bits and pieces. So hence why you might see a lot of this because I'm trying to <laughs> cover both bases and look at both cameras and also make sure that the audio is decent for both so right shall we cracketh on with today's podcast I have um an old dog new tricks but it's kind of like a a future giving of old dog new tricks. So I'm busy working away and hopefully I'll have this ready for Friday when the podcast goes live. But I'm working away on um, a set of information that you will be able to download either as a PDF that I will also put up on Instagram and Pinterest and that I will also have a blog post for. So I don't know if you're like me, how often it is that you have to go and check the difference in a yarn weight from US to UK and other places in the world, crochet hooks, because we've all got different systems using from the numbers to the letters. Um, what else is there? Oh, the crochet stitches and how often it is that you just have to kind of do a little retrace in your memory to work out what it is that you're meant to be doing. And every single time I do it, I end up taking to like a search engine and trying to find information that's correct. And it just creates a load of hassle and a load of time that I end up wasting. So I'm pulling together a quick guide for you on those three things. So stitches, yarn and hooks, needles. Um, and I will hopefully have them ready for Friday. If not, it won't be long uh, after that, before I've got them ready for you to all download and have a look at. So hopefully that means that you can just go to one location, you always know where that location is, and hopefully it will be the decent information that you're after, because you can get um, conflicting information, especially with the hook sizes. That, sorry, that was our tablet making a blingy bling noise. I don't know why. So, um, it's an old dog new tricks that I will be giving you information on um, and more just like trying to minimise the amount of time that you may also spend looking for those conversion differences um, for our craft. I can't think that anybody else has done it, I've not seen it before. I know people have done bits for the hooks, bits for the yarn, 
bits for the stitches, but I don't know anybody that's actually just pulled them all together into one guide. So that is what I'm working on. And I thought it would be so useful that I will just I'll let you know about it. And then, um, yeah, rush to get it ready for Friday for you. <laughs> Let's move on to en routes. Um, I have one to show you. I kind of don't really have like a major project on the go at the moment. And this one is nearly finished. I started this on Sunday. It was a full moon. I couldn't help myself. So it's not what I was meant to be doing. But I needed a chill out and uh, my head went, you need to design a camera strap. And so that is what I did. Um, I needed a new camera strap. I was looking online and I was like, why, like, why am I going to pay somebody else for a camera strap? Because I didn't just want to get a mass produced one. I was looking at like macrame camera straps. And I was like, well, you crochet and you do macrame. So why don't you just make your own? So that's what... Um, a chunk of Sunday was. So I used um, Erica Knight's Studio Linen because I had some in my stash and I had this gorgeous dark dark teal colour which is called Neo. It's really beautiful. Um, as with all of Erica Knight's Studio Linen the palette is quite muted um, and you know me, I love a muted colour. So what I did then was paired it up with this light dusky pink, um, which is called Mood. And I had um, 50 gram hanks of each and um, I've used well below 50 grams of both of them. So I probably could make another camera. I don't need another camera strap. <laughs> But I probably could make another one if I wanted to from these two colours. And I just love the pairing of that deep teal with that um, soft kind of dusky pink colour. It's really nice. And so what I did was looked at my old camera strap, measured that out and then um, basically came up with a little design, like a checkerboard design, using the teal as the main colour. So that's got the um, kind of border colour and then the teal and the pink for the checkerboard throughout the centre of the camera strap. Now obviously I could have used any yarn for this but thinking about it and thinking about the wearability of a camera strap I need something that's got a little bit of give um, but also something that's going to be durable but won't stretch too far. And the times that I probably use a camera strap most are um, in the summertime when I'm out and about in the field or maybe abroad somewhere. And when that is the case, I don't particularly want wool around my neck. And so that's another reason why I chose linen. And I'm really pleased with how it came out. I just I don't have an awful lot to do to finish it off. I literally just need to sew the tabs down I've got these kind of oval hooks with a metal clasp on them and I need to add them to either side of the ends of my, it's almost like a belt, it's like a woven belt almost, either end of my strap, then I can add some metal circles either side of my camera and then I can just clip the strap on when I need the strap and not have it on when I don't need it, so it's perfect. So. I'm pretty chuffed with that actually. I love how it turned out. I love the fact that it's something that is handmade by me fulfilling a need that I wanted and that I didn't like succumb to the internet <laughs> to get the thing that I needed. Um, I plan to, it's, this is a really easy pattern, so I plan to just quickly write it up, have it as a PDF and um, put it out as a freebie because this, this isn't something I would charge to, for. I'm not going to have a tech edited. You can just you can just have it. So I think what I'll probably do is put it um, as a freebie out to my Fady H Designs newsletter receivers first. So um, yeah, if you're already on that newsletter, then you will be receiving this shortly. And if you're not, you can join up. I have um, and I have four newsletters that I send out on a monthly basis. I do one each week in rotation. So there is one for this podcast. Um, and that goes out on the Friday that the podcast goes out. That contains all of the show links, um, any extra bits and pieces of information that I've come across because inevitably something happens, something is mentioned after I've 
press the uh, stop record button. Um, I then also have a newsletter for the shop for Provenance Craft Co. I also have the newsletter for my design stuff, Sophie DH Designs. And I have a newsletter for the house and what we're doing in the house with the renovation and um, just how we live in the house, like our plan to have more intentional living and what that means for us. So like more cooking outside, growing our own vegetables, hints and tips on DIY, that sort of stuff. Because as you know, I am not busy enough and I just need more things in my life. I don't, I, I don't do sitting idle, it's not my thing. So, um, yeah, this will go out to Fade H Design newsletter folks first. And I will be testing it out this weekend because I will be out in the garden um, doing bits and pieces. So this needs to be finished off so that I can use it in the garden. This, um, this, te this dark teal colour of the linen just makes me so happy. And I think... I maybe need to top out of this. The problem is I have got loads of this um, dusky pink colour. I have got loads of the grey colour, even though I've already um, made a, a linen top out of that. I did um, Tiger's Eye handmade top called the Everyday Tea last year. But, like, this, is, this teal is my colour. This is my jam. This is, like, so utterly my thing. Uh... But I do not need to buy more yarn. You'll see why when we get into feeding the habit. So that is my one little en route um, for today. But I have already picked out my next project. I keep on seeing it on Pinterest. And it just like, you know when something just keeps on popping up. And it, I, I don't think it's algorithm based. I don't think it's like people spying in my phone and listening into my conversations because it's like an internal thought where I've gone, oh, I like that. And maybe I've like stopped on it for a period of time. Um, and that's why the algorithm has picked up and gone, she really wants to make this. But it is a pullover and it is called, let me just double check. It is called the Blocked and Cropped Crochet Pullover and it's by a designer called Svetlana Avrak. And it's for patterns. Um, it's a free pattern. I've provided the link in the um, show notes and um, I'll pop a photo up here so that you can have a look for it and also in the show notes. It's really quite funky and I actually quite like the chunky neck on it. I might have to do some fiddling to pull the sleeves in a little bit because they're, they're quite baggy but the, it's essentially not even a three quarter length. It maybe comes to just above the elbow um, for a top and it's quite baggy so I might pull it in a little bit and make it a bit more fitted or for once I could stop fiddling with a pattern and maybe just do what it is that the designer wants you to do it'll never happen but I'll yeah maybe with this one I'll try it I can always rip it back because it's using a worsted add-in um, weight yarn and um, so it'll be really quick to work up as well but with the three quarter length sleeves, not three quarter, but with the kind of half length sleeves, I figured it could be a good transition top going into springtime when you still need something on. It's not quite like stra strappy top weather, but you know when it gets hot, cold, hot, cold, or there's a bit of a breeze and you just want something that you can fling on and take off. So hopefully I will have started that this month. And also put some love into my clean lines shawl from Anna Nikopedowitz. I just, um, it's there, it's just over there. It just needs me to start. It's not that I've got a head block on it. It's just, it's just time basically. I need concentrated time on it. And I just haven't had any of that because uh, we've just done the dining room. For those of you are watching, the wall is a different colour. You might not be able to tell. It's, I've just painted it all out, like the ceiling, everything. It took a full weekend. So that was a full weekend of no crochet, no crafting whatsoever. Um, yeah, time is against me at the moment as we try to get the first phase of the house done. Um, that said, I'm super excited because I've had a funky idea for my clean lines shawl and also for that um, blocked and cropped crochet pullover. 
I just want to crochet all the things at the moment. I'm not picking up knitting needles, I'm not really doing anything else. It's just all about crochet. With my very limited time. So I've got two finished objects that I've managed to get through this month. Um, the first one is another version of the Positivity Spiral Cowl. That's the one that's on the front cover of the um, podcast episode. Um, that is in John Arban Textiles Alpaca Supreme Lace Weight. They're relaunching that Lace Weight yarn on the 24th of April. So I don't think they've had it for a while. Oh, God, it's beautiful. It's got mulberry silk in it and it just... It's divine. It's Lace Weight. Slight girl, I'm getting over myself with lace weight. Um, so it's not particularly quick to work up, but I was using a three millimeter hook with it. Um, but I was kind of sad to see it go when it went. I was like, oh, I really, <laughs> really quite like you. I mean, the real beauty of doing something like alpaca and silk in a lace weight with a, a bigger hook is that it's just so light and airy and yet warm. And that's exactly how this cowl came out. It was just really pleased with it so I'll pop some photos in the show notes as well and you can have a look but that's why I don't have it here to show you because um, it had to be sent with haste down to the mill for them to be able to do bits and pieces with so another lace weight, pro lace weight project done I seem to be doing a lot of them recently and then the other thing that I finished was my big plant pot which was from the Fair Isle Crochet Workshop book that I showed you last month. I provided links for it in the um, show notes. But I kind of supersized the plant pot and I really love it. So I used um, the colour on the bottom that I wasn't that fussed about because actually it gets quite well hidden when the plant is inside and that was a... Um, kind of lightish turquoise, dirty turquoise blue colour. The wool that I was using is one that I've had in my stash for forever and um, it's stuff that I get from or got from Eliza Conway when I was doing yarn shows and you know when hu human contact was a thing. Um, so it's been in my stash for a long long time and I just wanted to use it up and it is absolutely perfect for the plant pot. And again, this is another case of, I need a plant pot. Well, why am I going to go and buy one? I can make one, I'm perfectly capable. Um, so I used a five millimeter hook with this one and you're holding, it's essentially like a DK iron weight yarn, but you're holding them double stranded. So that double stranding makes them a much thicker yarn. And then of course it's, um, it's colour work, so you're doing tapestry crochet with it as well. So not only do you have the double strands, you also have the double strands of the yarn that you're carrying too. So that makes quite a dense fabric that stands up rather nicely on its own, which is exactly what I wanted for a plant pot. I don't want to wash and starch this. I want it to have that kind of natural, like slight crimp that you get with it. Um, when something's standing up, it, it stands up really nicely on its own. So I've taken some photos for you to show you um, how it looks with the plant in it in our bedroom. And what I plan to do, like a really good tip if you're going to make your own plant pots, I have got some plastic sheeting that I use for decorating to protect the floors. And um, I plan to just cut out a square of that because it's really quite nice thick plastic. I wouldn't use a plastic bag because the potential for that to get ripped is quite high. And then all I'm going to do is um, create mould that into the plant pot so that then the plant pot can sit on top of that. And then when I've watered my plants, which I tend to do and I soak them in water, I don't feed them from the top, I let the roots take up the water. But that means the bottom of the plant pot can be wet. So when I put the plant pot back in, it's going onto the plastic and then I'm not going to get issues on the carpet or on a wooden floor if I move the plant pot about. Um, and it won't rot away the base of my plant pot either. So I wouldn't use a plastic bag, I would use a thicker plastic for that. And if I'm really concerned, I might even double it up. But that will just sit inside my crochet plant holder 
and um, protect the the wool and then my plant will sit quite happily in there and it will still be able to breathe and it will be it will be fine so i'm really pleased with this like i love the diamond um effect i love the colors i've used so it's a rust color with a warm um cream and um yeah i i just i think it looks lovely in the position that i've put it in um up in our bedroom with the plant that i've chosen and I've deliberately um, kind of supersized this pot and made it bigger than I needed because the plant that I wanted to put in it is not that far from outgrowing its plant pot. So what I've done is built contingency into this plant pot because when I repot the plant, it will still fit in its plant pot. So I made it quite a bit taller than I needed and it's um, a good bit bigger on the circumference. But it can grow, the plant can grow and it will still sit in its lovely little crocheted pot. It's all about crocheted homewares at the moment. <laughs> I wonder why. Did somebody move house? Um, yeah, and I'm now eyeing up every other plant pot and like odd bits and pieces of wool that I've got that would be perfect for plant pots. So there might be more in my future. But I'm really pleased with this one. I do love it. Um, colour work crochet is quite slow going less so when you use a 5mm hook and double strands of iron yarn though. so let me move on to feeding the habit some yarn has come over our threshold um, some of it for commissions which I can't show you yet because that's the nature of commissions you don't really get to show off what's going on until it's actually gone out and um, kind of been published. Needless to say, the yarn for my Murit magazine uh, submission has come. I'm very excited about that. I have got a blanket commission that I'm, I'm looking at it now. It's over there. I have a blanket commission that I need to finish off and then I'm onto it with my Murit uh, commission. So I'm still so very excited about that magazine, that crochet magazine. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go and have a look at Murit Mag on Instagram and see what it's all about. Very exciting high-end crochet magazine that is coming. Um, I think it's September time that Alison is going to be um, sending out the first episode. Issue. <laughs> it's an issue. <laughs> right. So what has come in that I can show you? Well, I have two cones sat on the table in front of me. And what I realised when I was pulling together all of the stuff for the uh, podcast is clearly I have a colour palette at the moment because I've just finished a plant pot which is in rust and a warm cream. And the wool that I had come through is a rust colour wool with a natural cream colour. It's not just got quite the same kind of blush on it that the one from the plant pot does, but it's still like pretty much the same colour combination. <laughs> I know why it is. It's because our metal accent colour for this house is going to be copper. So um, because I know that and I'm busy buying things that are like this deep, not not like a rose gold copper, like deep proper um weathered copper colour so I'm just attracted to all things rust and colour and copper at the moment and I always have been but I've got like heightened uber awareness for anything that is within this colour range. So I have got two cones of the rust colour and one cone of the cream and this is either going to be a blanket which is what I actually bought it for or it might become my blocked and cropped crochet pullover because I just think that needs three colours and it's got um, a checkered effect in blocks and I just think these two colours together would be amazing and then if you introduce like, let's just test my theory, if you introduce a teal into that or a navy, I mean what a colour combo, this is just like this is this is all fee cream teal rust so yeah all of these colors 
are 100% me. Love them. Oh, especially look at the richness of that teal and that copper together. Mm -hmm. we'll, see, we'll see what's going to happen with these. They may not become a blanket. They may have to be a pullover. But I wanted to um, talk to you about Woolly Knit for quite a while. That's the company that I bought these cones of yarn from. They are a company based in the north of England. And they do all sorts of different types of yarn. The reason that I was interested in these two on the cone is because they are actually British wool. Um, they also do hanks and um, balls of British wool as well. And one of the kind of things I hear quite a lot is, oh, British wool is really expensive. I, d I don't think it is because obviously the amount of labour, time and processing that goes on with it means that it has a price tag attached to it. But if you wanted to try British wool for the first time and you didn't you didn't want to pay out for the not higher end because that's unfair. If you didn't want to pay, let's say, fifteen, twenty pounds for a skein of yarn, then take a little look at Woolen It and what they do because they quite often have sales on and even without the sale this cone of 400 grams of Aran weight yarn is £20. So I picked these up when they had 20% off, which means that each of these cones was £16 for 400 grams. Now it's Aran weight and I think their conversion brings it out to about 155 metres per 100 grams. Um, but that is a really, really amazing price for... Um, for wool, for British wool. They also do um, a sock yarn, they also do cotton, they've got a cotton linen mix, they've got all sorts of stuff and like I say they'll do it from balls to hanks and on the cone so depending on how much you need it makes it a really affordable way of getting yarn. So go and have a look at wool in it. The Links are in the show notes for you and they do some really nice colours as well and they've got some slightly tweedy ones. I might have a jumper's quantity from the first order that I got from them. I shouldn't have ordered this but I can't remember why I did. I think I was feeling a bit low and I was like, I need more wool in my life. <laughs> I mean, I do not need more wool in my life but it's rust and cream. How could you say no to rust and cream? <laughs> so... Those two are in. They, oh, I think there might be a jumper. Or a blanket. Or a jumper. Or a blanket. And the other thing that I got from Woolly Knit, and I've been eyeing this up for a long old time, they do these mega hanks. <laughs> I do mean mega, like, for the listeners. Oh, it's so sheepy. My arms are stretched out. I am holding this massive hank. I think it's 1.7 kilos. It's incredible. And it is a chunky yarn. They call it like a rug yarn. And they specifically say it could be used for macrame. So the one that I've got is undyed. And it's essentially like um, a wool roving. So no plies together. Just one strand. And it has been felted. What that means is you get the most amazing stitch definition of this. So it would be perfect for rugs, but also perfect for macrame. And I, I'm just, I'm not sure which way I'm going to go with this. This massive hank was £20. It's enough to do a rug for sure. It's also enough to do a huge macrame wall hanging, which is like right up there on my list. I have the driftwood ready to go. I just need to um, work out what kind of wall hanging I want to make. But I, I, I want to work on a really ornate macrame wall hanging. And I think this is just begging to be that. I cannot tell you, as I sit here squishing this wall, how sheepy it smells. Like, I could be out walking on the moors with sheep surrounding me in sheep poo. That is how sheepy this is. It's incredible. So, this... Um, yeah, this is going to be something. 
that sounds quite vague, doesn't it? But given that I was ordering the cones and there was 20% off the cones, I thought I would just get this scent at the same time so I could test it out. I mean, it is heavy. It's the biggest tank I think I've ever lifted in my lifetime. And, um, yeah, it, need, it needs to be something really beautiful. But again, au naturel, undyed, lovely, totally different from the lace weight undyed alpaca silk that I was working with um, from John Arvin, but it's just, it's just so nice. I'd love to think I would get to this at the Easter weekend, but I just, I don't think I am. We are trying to take time off um, over the bank holiday weekend because we've just been <laughs> we've been burning the candle at both ends and the pair of us have just been work, work, work. And um, yeah, we're going to try and take some time off. And by time off, what we mean is the veggie patch needs to be sorted. The shed needs to be painted. House actually needs a clean. I mean, that's a good idea, isn't it? To clean your house. And uh, we just have stuff to do out in the garden. So a day off is not losing about for us. A day off is household stuff. Um, but hopefully in all of that, over four days that we plan to not really be sat at computers, hopefully in those four days I can get some crafting done and just relax maybe with a glass of Pim's. Maybe that's a thing that needs to happen. And just um, chill out outside. So that is nearly all of the incoming yarn. The reason I keep on looking outside is because we put the bird feeder up and um, they are loving it. And you might be able to, I hope you can hear them because they're really chatty at the moment and they are going through bird seed like nobody's business I'm topping it up every other day which makes me really happy because um, you know birds need support especially at this time of year when they are looking to rear their young and easy food makes all the difference for them and it means that the insects can survive and thrive and that's really good for the ecosystem so we feed the birds all year round for that purpose we need the insects too. Um, right, let's put away my massive hank of yarn and show you the other thing that came in the post. So last month I was telling you about the fact that I wanted to make um, some macrame crochet wall hangings outside to um, go on our little wall bit. I've now created the herb garden we've got seating out there so right now the sun is coming right down onto the back part of our garden and my little herb garden seating area gets the sun in the morning up to about half 11 at the moment and then it gets the sun again in the evening so the two times of day that I would naturally want to be out there having a cup of tea just taking a breather is exactly when the sun is out there so basically when it's not at its full heat because I burn really rapidly so I want to put some hanging baskets out there just so there are some nice flowers and in particular geraniums because I really love the scent of geranium so I also got in some more of the bobbinet cotton which is a recycled cotton um, and I got the charcoal and it's 100 meters to the is it 100 grams? I think it is it must be more than that whatever it is I have a hundred meters and I got two of them so one for each planter we've got two old um plant hooks that are already in the side of the shed of the wooden uh, that are in the side of the stone built shed so I just want to make use of them and what I found and I'm so pleased with this find this is from a website called Baker um, and it's a double K, so B-A-K-K-E-R, they have these plant pots, which on face value either look like um, galvanised steel or concrete, but they're really, really light, and I particularly love them because they are, I think it's 50% concrete or um, cement and 50% recycled plastic. I've never seen this before in a plant pot and I've never seen 
um, like a garden company trading on sustainability. And what it means is that they're really light because if this was just cement or concrete, it would be really heavy. And then when you put soil and a plant in it as well, like really heavy. But it's got these really awful cords for hanging. So obviously that needs macrame in. But what it does mean is it's already got three holes in the actual plant stand itself. So the maker of this, if anybody is looking for hanging plant pots that are a bit different, the maker of this is called, um, it's the TS Collection. It comes from the Netherlands and it's called Ceramix. And it's got the badge for being eco-friendly. It's also frost-proof and um, it could be used indoors or outdoors and it's got this really nifty reservoir inside it as well so it'll actually retain some of the water but it still have hole, has holes so it can drip out so my plan is to use the macrame cotton to um, crochet a base for it because that will be really quite nice and structurally sound just a little bit, not so that it's coming up too high and then do some macrame to come up. A macrame hanger from the bottom and to join the two pieces where the holes are so that I can make it all structurally sound. Um, I think that's what I'm going to do, but there, I might need to get the ball in and out. So whatever, I'll think about it and come up with a plan. But the idea is to keep it in this kind of galvanised steel look and grey because... This is the grey of our tables and chairs and our woodworks. It's just going to pull it all in together. And then you've got um, some lovely cream geraniums in there. And I've got some really vivid purple um, violas as well. So this is going to look like quite a cheery little pot, which is why I don't mind having grey to begin with, because it's eventually going to be all floral and cream and, and purple. So... Um, this like this is the project that I really want to do this Easter weekend but oh we shall see veggie patch comes first so hopefully the two um, amounts that I got of the macrame cord will be enough for that and again I love that this is an almost 100% recycled project so 100% recycled cotton with the bobbin and that is in the colour charcoal and 50% recycled plastic for my plant pot. Well chuffed. And this wasn't expensive. The plant pot was only, I think it was £13. Which, given how much you can pay for some of the other ones, I thought it was a really good deal. I love that it's so lightweight. So, Macrame Planter, signed off by Matthew, coming to our house soon. So we're going to move on to the second part of the hive, which is my design process. Um, this one's kind of all about tools and how I jot down the beginning stages of uh, design, basically. So I've got my yarn, I've got the hook size I think that I want to use and what I need is my rough sketch pad. So I use uh, an A5 notepad and I use um, dotted pads rather than lines or squares, it just means that I can um, I've got a guide for them so I can make my writing quite neat and also it means that I've got squares there if I need them to quickly sketch out some colour work bits and pieces. The, the one that I'm using here is by a company called Fabriano and all of the tools I'm talking about I've linked in the um, show notes. And then I have it in a really nice leather bound A5 wallet which is helpful because the Fabriano notebooks are glued and then when I've finished, partially finished with a pattern, I can just keep it in the leather bound part of it, kind of wedged in there, so I don't lose bits of paper. That's really helpful. They can't fall out if the notepad is shaken and I'm moving around with it because this gets shoved into my handbag, it's used in the car. I use it all over the place, so that keeps it all neat and together. The other thing that I use is a Pilot friction pen. It basically is a pen that is also a pencil. So it uses the heat of friction on the end of the pen and you can rub out anything that you've done. Now, 
Yes, a pencil will do the same thing, but I personally find that pencils are too thick for my, I've got quite small handwriting. And if I'm using a pen, I am neater and I am more precise. And that's something that I like to be when I'm designing. I don't like things to be scattered and messy because it really clouds my brain. So if something is nice and neat, then I'm more likely to work on it. And that's why I love the friction pens, because if I make a mistake, let's say I change some elements like the number of chains I'm working with, or I change um, the hook size that I'm working with, I can rub it out and I can put in the new information. I love these pens and they've got a really fine um, tip on them as well. The other reason I love them is because environmentally, they do refills for them, so I don't have to throw away the casing. I can just buy new refills. Obviously, there's still waste involved in the refill, but it's the better than brand new pens all the time. Love these pens. So I've got my notebook ready. I've got my pen, my favourite pen ready. And the other bit that I need are my jewellery scales. These ones will weigh up to 200 grams to two decimal places. They are amazing. So I've got my notepad, my pen and my jewellery skills together. I've noted down what the yarn is I'm going to be um, working with. And for that, what I tend to do is note down the manufacturer, the meterage, the colourway that I'm using, what I think is going to be the main colour and the contrast colours in order if I'm using contrast colours. And then for every single one of those first skeins of yarn that I'm working with, I will take a really accurate measurement of their weight. So onto the jewellery scales and it's telling me that that ball of studio linen is 50.71 grams. That is really accurate and that's exactly what I'm looking for and I'll tell you why. So all of those weights will get noted down. Then what I'm going to do is create a swatch with my yarn. And we're not talking like a little teeny tiny little swatch. You're looking at 15 centimetres by 15 centimetres. Generally with a swatch you're looking to be able to measure over a 10 centimetre area. So doing a 10 centimetre by 10 centimetre swatch isn't enough because you want to, to be looking at the gauge in the centre of that. So 15 centimetres by 15 centimetres it was what you're after. When I've got um, the beginning of my swatch, so my starting chain, I then note down how many chains I've used and I will weigh the yarn again. So that gives me a starting measurement for the yarn and then I know how much my starting chain weighed because I don't want that to go into my next set of measurements and skew them, which it will. So I know if I've used, let's say, 30 starting chains um, for my swatch and my overall piece and it uses one grams and my overall piece is going to use 120 um, starting chains, then I know that my starting chain is going to need four grams of yarn for my finished piece. And that's ultimately why I'm recording the weights because I want to know how much each section of my design is going to need in terms of yarn. So we've weighed it at the beginning, I've weighed it again off to my starting chains and then I'm going to work up my entire 15 centimetre by 15 centimetre swatch. And um, then at the end of that I'm going to weigh it again and I'm going to record that again. And while I'm recording that what I'm also putting in is the number of stitches I've used and the number of rows or rounds I've put into that swatch. And what that means is that when I've got all of that information together, I have got all the information that I can then kind of zoom out to for my final design. So let me show you how that would work. Because what I'm going to do is take, let's, if I'm going to use this blanket as an example, let's say I've got a 15 centimetre swatch of this blanket. What I then do is plug all of that detail into a spreadsheet, into Excel. And from the weights information, I know exactly how much 
weight I need in terms of yarn per stitch. And if I know what it is per stitch, then I can start working out how long my rows could be or how many rows I can get out of the amount of yarn that I think that I want to use. So for example, the blanket that I'm holding up is my Strata blanket. I used Excel formulas to be able to work out from the grams per stitch that I got from my very accurate weight in, um, information. I knew that a blanket of however many stitches I did would do this number of rows and that I wouldn't be left with lots and lots of yarn at the end of it. So it allows me to make the best use of the amount of yarn that I think the project should require. By doing that and getting that really detailed information from a 15 centimetre swatch, I can really look at whether a project is going to run or not. So for example, I've got one that I'm kind of questioning at the moment because the swatch information tells me that I would need 300 grams of wool for a cushion. And these skeins are £15 each, which means that it's £45 for a cushion. And that for me is a little bit like, oh, that's maybe just on the pricing point. Now, obviously, people could substitute their yarn. But from doing that small amount of swatching, I know whether or not that is most likely going to be a viable project or whether it's one that I need to knock on the head. And there are various projects that I have knocked on the head because from my small amount of swatching, I've been able to say that's too much money, that's too much yarn. And I haven't had to put all of that effort into creating an entire thing to get to that end decision point because my small amount of swatching with really accurate weights and measurements tells me that it's not viable or it is viable. So I'm really cutting down the amount of work that I would need to do. And what it also allows me to do, if I come back to the um, striped blanket that I'm holding up, is I can work out what the yarn sequences need to be to make most use of that yarn. Now, most designers will add a 10 to 20% extra threshold in yarn usage to cover differences in gauges and to cover the people that can't be bothered to do a gauge swatch. So they have to cover their own backs and it's generally about a 10 to 20% threshold. So I can work out from my Excel spreadsheet whether I'm in, within that threshold because nobody wants to get to the end of a project and then need like 10 extra grams or an extra skein because they've been out so that's why designers would add that in and i am no different i tend to be on the tighter side rather than the looser side of crochet and if somebody isn't going to swatch and they're going to do a really loose um part of my design then they're going to need quite a lot more yarn reality is just swatch just do the swatch just try and get caged that makes life so much easier so all of that information from a really small swatch then allows me to look at how i can size a project so for the bags for instance i can very quickly see whether i could do a super side version of the bag or a much smaller version of the bag and whether I can stay within the tolerances of what I think is an affordable amount of yarn for that project. And I haven't even, still haven't, um, like even started the project properly. Um, all I've done is a swatch. So that's how I get to that part. Then when I'm moving on from there, what I do, because I've got all my information in Excel, I've got my rough notes in my notebook and then I have a proper fancy pants notebook as well, which is like my final designs notebook. And for this one, I use a Dingbats notebook. I really love Dingbats and what they do. I've got completely separate notebooks that I use for my own personal crafting. And for that, I use Adventures in Yarn um, Journal notebook from Emily. I'll talk about that another day because she's been doing some amazing stuff with her notebook. Um, but for my design stuff, because I'm looking for really specific stuff, again, I am using Dotted and the Dingbats ones are actually perforated as well. So when I've finished a design, I can 
take it out and I can file it, which means I'm never going to lose all of my things out of this one notebook if I lose my notebook. I've still got all the information and a lot of the information sits in that Excel spreadsheet as well. Um, I also love that the Dingbats has got a little folder in the back, so if I've got any design sketches in there, like I've just seen one that I totally forgot about, that's quite handy, and ball bands and bits and pieces for a project will sit in there until I have finished that project and then I will combine them all together. It's got a neat little bit for holding my pen in there as well. And again, it's hardback, so this can come and be in my handbag when I'm out and about. And it's got the elastic bit to bind it all together. Really like doing um, as a, as a good designer notebook. Um, I'm trying to not give anything away here, but the reason that I've got a final notebook is because this is where I... Um, write up all the bits and pieces really neatly. So in here I've got um, who the submission is for, the hook size, whether I changed it for the body, the total amount of grams, the date, um, the stitches that I'm using, and then I write properly write out the pattern. And that means I go from rough notes into my final project here, and then I've got this to refer back to when I'm writing up the pattern properly and getting it ready for tech editing. And that means I am um, like being really precise about making sure that the pattern works because I'm effectively redoing it in my head after I've taken my rough notes. And then um, that's the other reason for keeping the Excel spreadsheet is because I can also send that to my tech editor, Deb, so she will quite often get the Excel spreadsheet and then if she needs to question any of my numbers, she's got my thinking there in the formulas that I've used and in the information that I've um, got and extrapolated out of that Excel spreadsheet. So if she needs to check anything, she doesn't need to um, come to me and question me. She can see what my thinking is through that spreadsheet. So it's really helpful. And also as a designer, it's quite helpful, particularly if you're submitting your designs to a magazine or to your tech editor. It's amazing how having that Excel spreadsheet can kind of unravel what your thinking is. How did you get to that sizing? How did you get to that meterage? How did you calculate how many stripes? You can kind of unravel your web through your formulas and see what you started out with and how you got to that information because quite often you can be looking at um, a tech edit or something that you submitted and you might have done it six months ago you've moved on like you've way moved on to the next design and the next and the next and your brain isn't in that headspace anymore so the excel spreadsheet your rough notes and your final notes are really good for being able to go no this is right this is why i did it this way this is why i made those design choices the more accurate you are with your information, the easier your design process will be. And this is like talking from somebody who knows because I've been there when I've had to redo things and remake things and that is not fun, that feels like wasted time. So really this next phase is all about recording information and from that swatch and then I um, can calculate how many stitches how big the overall piece will be, um, whether uh, it needs to be rounder with the circumference, whether it's going to be fit for purpose, all sorts of information will go into that. For something like a bag, I am less inclined to block it, but if it was um, a garment or a shawl, I would get that information for it unblocked, and I would also then block my swatch, wet block it, and see how it changes and record that information as well. And again, that would go into my rough notebook and then it would go into my finalised notebook. And when I say wet block it, I don't mean pinning it out. What I want to see is how is that material going to react as you would just have worn it and washed it. So let's say I've got a square of um, this. I'm not going to pin it out. I'm literally going to wash it wring it dry a little bit and then leave it out on the side. I'm not going to pin it. 
I'm not going to try and change the measurements. I'm not going to try and make it fit to what I think it should be. I'm just going to leave that swatch on the side and then re-record that information. So I would then measure it again, how many stitches over a 10 centimeter length and how many rounds or rows over a 10 centimeter length after blocking. And that information is then vital because I am then building up that knowledge bank of what is happening with that yarn in that specific stitch. That information is really, really helpful because if I then come to do a project with the same yarn or a very similar yarn, then I have got that information sat there ready to go back to. And again, I'm just, with every design, I'm creating a shortcut for myself and making sure that I am keeping that bank of knowledge and never just wasting my time by not recording things properly. Um, like I say, that is learned behaviour because I don't know how many times I've started designs and not recorded the information properly, come back to write up the pattern maybe three months later and go, ah, <laughs> why didn't I write down exactly what that stitch pattern was? And, you know, that's why even with my rough notes, I will quickly chart something out. I will do a rough chart out of what it is if it's a pattern that needs to be charted. I just will record as much information as possible and make my life as easy as possible. So we are um, we had our first hive session, Zoom session last Saturday, and the next one is going to be on the 24th of April at three o'clock. And we have got Michelle from Dora Does joining us for that because we're talking about sales platforms and the different places that you can sell your patterns from. Um, the last session was really good. Thank you everybody that attended that. That was a really good chatty session and thank you to Becky at Rivernets and Marcus at Rivernets for coming and joining us. It was really helpful to get their perspective on um, yarn support from a yarn dyer's point of view. I will be creating a blog out of that session and I will be creating a blog out of the next session as well. So hopefully, even if you can't make the sessions, if you've got like general interest in the design process, then that information will be available to you as soon as I've written the blog post for each one of them. Um, so next month, hopefully, I will have actually done the swatch for a bag using all of the processes that I've just spoken about and um, I will actually have the beginnings of a bank design and worked out which one I want to start with. I've got a couple of them. Um, the reason I haven't started is because the two that I want to start with I'm playing around with the structure of them in my mind and I know how big I want the bags to be roughly but it's how I do the base of the bag with the body of the bag and I've got a couple of neat little ideas I just want to play around with and they're kind of still filtering through my noodle brain at the moment so they're not quite ready to commit to the hook and the yarn um, so I'm, I'm just gonna they're nearly there they're coming <laughs> um, so next month I will have finally actually put a hook into some yarn for this design series but hopefully you can see how involved it is before you even get to that point like there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes before you just start uh, a design it's a very involved process so we are on to quick news beats the next global hookup is on the 17th of april at 8 p.m british summer time and sunday the 18th of April at 9am British summer time, so it's 17th and 18th of April. Um, if you, All the details are in the show notes, but it's basically the same code it always is, 475-047-5819, and the passcode is in the show notes. I also put it into the newsletter, so if you sign up to the newsletter, I can send all of this information straight to you um, on Friday. Um, I mentioned already that the next Hive session is on the 24th of April with Michelle from Dora Does. That's at 3 o'clock. And that is the same code for Zoom. And the passcode is HIVE in capitals, H-I-V-E. And is that it? 
um, Mighty Networks. So if you want to come and join us from the Crochet um, Clan Forum, that is on Mighty Networks and you just need to search Crochet Clan. Equally, there's an invite in the show notes, so you can come and join us through that. It'd be lovely to have you in there. It's a really lovely growing community, which is nice to see. I think there's nearly, it's either like 150 or 200 of you in there, which is really nice. Um, and it's a very kind of self-supporting forum. And yeah, it's lovely to see you all coming in there, showing your finished objects, sharing articles. It's, it's a lovely space. Um, yeah, so that's that's it for good news, good news beats, quick news beats. So my final bit is J'adore and what I'm really loving, if I pull my little um, camera strap, what I'm really loving at the moment is this kind of rethink button that I've had where previously I would have just gone, oh I need a camera strap, I'll go and buy one. I need a plant, pot holder, I'll go and buy one. And this idea of actually turning to what I've already got in my stash, like the power that I have in my hands to be able to create. And probably my biggest issue is that I am time poor. Poor. I'm time poor. But like the ability to just say, I don't need to buy that. I can make it for myself. And how much nicer that is to have something at the end of it is like me made that's it it makes something more special i don't want something that's been mass manufactured if i can help it it's all the better if it's been like created from my own brain my own hands or somebody else's design and i'm really enjoying that at the moment and the qualities that it's bringing to this household is very enjoyable so long may that continue right that is it for me next time i'm back is the 7th of may which feels like quite a long and it's probably about five weeks really so i shall see you then if not i will be on uh, in mighty networks and on instagram and over on pinterest too have a lovely Easter uh, weekend, everybody, if you're catching this before the weekend starts. Whatever you are doing, I hope you have a good one. I will be out making a veggie patch happen and doing some crochet in the sun, hopefully. Enjoy, have a lovely time, and I shall see you next one. Bye-bye! Obviously I'm waving. <laughs> Bye-bye! Or just go again, Fee. That's what you can do. You can just start recording all over again. Have some coffee. Get your shoes together. Can you hear the birds? You can probably hear a Matthew as well. He's quite loud. Like, I can't wait until I get my outdoor studio space again. Because he's noisy. First one up is I have a little set of jewellery, jewellery scales. <laughs> jewellery is apparently quite a lot like Ravelry and I can't see it. It's something about the LRY bit that my brain just fogs over and I just don't get it.